All right, for sure, live with Lazo, the Godfather of West Coast Hip Hop. And today, my guest is, is somebody by request. They said, Lazo, you got all the brothers from, from uh, Southern California. Get us somebody from, uh, from up north and preferably uh, Digital Underground. Hey, man, here you go, folks. Today, my guest is strictly from the north, my man Money B from Digital Underground. What's up with you, Money B? What's happening with you, fam? Man, I'm just doing what I do. To I'm doing what I do, man. Just trying to uh, keep this history alive, man. I can dig it, <laughs> as you should, and as you do. Thank you, Doc. You know? I appreciate that. Uh, what you doing these days, man? I'm doing so much. Uh, of course, um, still touring, as always. You know, um, right now the the functioning members of this running around that are touring is Money Being Young Hump. Okay. And also from time to time DJ Fuse and Pee Wee, okay. original member, also a member of the Dangerous Crew. Too short. We go out on the road, um, so you'll always be able to catch us spreading the funk that way. I uh, also manage the um, Digital Underground merchandise, merchandising brand, so check out dumerch.com or digitalundergroundtshirts.com. That ought to be fun. Pick up some gear. Um, and of course, you know, I've, I've finished my book, my autobiography. What's it which, called? Um, um, you know, the working title right now is called Hype Man. The Money B story. And you know, a lot of people would, will say, like, Money B, you were never a hype man. But really, it, it's, it's a double meaning, meaning that, you know, throughout my career, or just in the, in the dynamics of Digital Underground, Shock G has always been looked at as the leader, right? right? So, and because Humpty, the Humpty Dance was our biggest hit, you know, he was the most recognizable character in our group. So while that's happening, I was always, even though, you know, equal member, I did just as much as a front man as an MC. The attention was always so much on those other characters that I was able to kind of stand back mm. and and see everything. So I could, I was I was able to look at people looking at us ah. without being looked at. You okay. understand what I'm okay. saying? I got that. And then the other part of it, the other part of it is, you know, when I say hype man, you know, the music industry is just one big hype machine. So we're all hype men. In a sense, you know, we're all part of this this hype machine called the music music industry because right. that's all it is. Right. It's, it's all it's all hype. You know, we we create these images and whatnot, and people invest and believe in them, and we run with it on now, both sides. What's your background, Doc? Um, you know, in my book, I kind of go into it. You know, even back before I was born, and and a lot of people don't know that my father was. A member of the Black Panther Party. So, you know, I grew up, I went to the Oakland Community School, which is school founded by the Panthers, a school that first um, initiated the free lunch and free breakfast program. They raised money for sickle cell anemia, which a lot of people didn't know that that was a, a, a mostly a, di a disease that affected mostly black people. Right. Um, you know, Huey P. Newton actually handed me my diploma when I graduated wow, that's deep. from the school. You know, yeah, there's, there's, there's pictures. So you're like a panther baby then? Out there. Yeah, I'm a panther cub. Okay, a panther through. cub. Okay, okay. Yeah, you know, that's what, we, that's what they call us. And that's what so how do you, is, is that something that you and Tupac had in common? I guess it's got to be. Yeah, absolutely. So the one thing where it was most prevalent is that when Tupac expressed himself, when, when he expressed himself or would share his ideas of how he thought, or how he saw the world or how he thought it should be, it wasn't foreign to me okay. because the ideas that were instilled in him were the same that were instilled in me. Okay. So where a lot of people looked at him crazy, I had already heard it before. You okay. know what I mean? Okay. So it wasn't far fetched to me. So if, you know, it was, uh, when, when we would talk, I guess he had a feeling of normalcy around me because I didn't freak out when he would say things. Mm. Okay. Or had these ideas that seemed like, what are you talking about? You know, I kind of understood where he was coming from. Even if even if I didn't agree, I still knew where, where okay. it was coming from. And we could have conversations about it and share, you know, similar stories about our background. And I, I got a question for you. Yeah. Sure. How, how was it working with Tupac, man? Oh, man. Uh, you know, one, I will always tell people his work ethic was greater than anything that I've ever experienced, mm. you know, since before and since then. You know, he had a work ethic 
out of this world and he had a, a complete um, confidence about himself from day one okay. that you know was undeniable now it could get it could get crazy at times just because he, he was he was so he believed him in himself so much he <laughs> was wrong he still, he still thought he was right you know what I, I mean? understand he had to deal with it on I, all levels I understand uh, uh, I tell people it's funny man uh, me and Atrian has been good friends forever before he even formed TNT Records and uh, right. for, him, for him to run into Tupac a few years later, and me and Tupac both have the same birthday. And he, he, okay. Adrian mentioned a couple of you guys remind me, that both of y'all think y'all could do anything y'all put your mind to, and pretty much think I yeah. can. And, you know, that's what and I that do. That, hey, if I say I think, if I think I can do it, this girl, I'm going to damn sure try uh, uh, to make it happen. And, you know, he laughs about that sometimes. Yeah, and the other thing about Pac is he wasn't afraid to question anything. Like, he, if you told him something, he'll ask you why. Mm, you know what I mean? Right, right. You don't just, you wouldn't just take, just because, just because somebody said it okay. doesn't make it true or like that's the law, you know, because, you know, man, man makes law, but not, you know, law is not just what a man says, <coughs> you know what I mean? I totally get it, Doc. I totally get it. So you guys, are uh, you touring, are you a regular tour now? You just going on spot dates and having a good time like we used to or? Well, I mean, it's it's a lot of spot dates. There okay. have been tours. There are tours that are being looked at and worked on as we speak. So, you know, like right now on our schedule, I know we got a date, a few dates coming up. Um, you know, I don't want to share all of them. Some of them are, are surprise dates. Okay. You know what I mean? We're, we're surprise guests at certain events and whatnot. So. Okay. But we're working. Okay, sure. I think that's a good thing, man. I'm, I'm looking forward to doing some dates myself this year uh, with World Class Wrecking Crew, and it's just mm -hmm. amazing, man. That you know the phone don't ring as much when it does ring. You know, it, they, they, it's real. So it's a good thing to go out yeah. there and have a good. It's it's a good thing to be able to go out and do what you love doing at our age. I don't know about you, at, at my age, you know, it's it's still fun to be able to go out there and do it. People still love what you do, and you guys represent. Yeah, and the fact that they yeah, yeah that their people still. You know, respect it, enjoy it, or whatever. You, you know guys what had like, you guys had a funk thing, man. That was out of this world, though, dude. I mean, oh yeah. You know, for uh, for not to be a band per se, but to have these funky cuts, man. I was talking to Adrian about some of the things you guys have done with uh, the Humpty Dance being used in commercials, and you know, uh, there's so much going on, man. That's just that's a hell of a thing, that. Well, you know what? A lot of people don't know, and I don't even know if. if if he would even want this to be shared, but fuck it. Come on. Um, Shock used to be in a funk man. Ah, <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, he, I forget the name. Oh, man, I can't remember the name of it. But he was in a band briefly. Okay. And I believe he was like the keyboard player. But, he, like but Shock's like an accomplished piano player too, right? He is. Oh, man, he's a genius. Wow, okay. Uh, that's uh, I, Adrian told me that. He said, this brother can sit on the piano. And he, he's trained in classical music and the whole nine yards. So he's he, well, well, he can, and he was self, you know, self taught. Wow, which is more amazing. So and he knows it. Okay, is there a reason why he don't tour anymore? Or just he just tired of it and just. Well, I think some certain people, you know, they 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 want to move and do it. Okay, as they feel. So for whatever reason, if if he's tired or he's just not enjoying it, you know, from explanation to us he just wanted to take a break okay. but he's okay with uh, everybody else continuing and, mm -hmm. and carrying on and that's the a big see the fault that's a big move right there man to say man y'all go ahead and keep on doing this i'll get back with y'all later on man and a lot of cats will be hating right. on that man and that's that's a that's a, a real dude move right there um that's a real player move right there um i got to commend him on that and you know it's just it's just amazing man um that you know well, how long you guys about 30 years 35 years now um uh the first digital underground record was 1988 wow and the first record that i appeared on was in 89 which was do what you like which okay. came out in 89 okay so this is 31 years when i remember h when he dropped uh he first dropped underwater rhymes i'm like who is digital mm -hmm. underground and what is an underwater rhyme? But it, it brought me back to 
George Clinton and P Funk when they was doing the underwater boogie and blah 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 blah. So it it was a whole different thing, man. Now you you guys are from Oakland, right? Yeah. Okay. Now I got a question, man. I was sitting up here thinking one day, and I thought about this on my podcast. And when I think about Oakland and up north, northern California, you guys have uh, you guys Hammer Paris um, E Forty Too Short, and no two groups are alike and you guys still maintain your individuality but you still maintain the, the southern california in um vibe are there gangs in in uh northern california no no there are no gangs in northern california well there were like back then the only place that you had gangs were um like sacramento okay it's from what i remember back then you know, they, there was a lot of blood. Well, and Sacramento was about, what? 50 miles? Maybe 100 miles okay. north. Okay. Nah, it's a little bit further. It's about an hour hour drive. So if you, you know, everybody in Southern California, if if Oakland's L.A., then Sacramento is like San Bernardino or something like that. Okay, you know, it's just, okay. It's, a little, it's out the way, right? Okay. So that's, the only, that's as far as it can. You got you to gotta remember that a lot of this, this gang culture is centralized in the prisons right okay so up north we had the black gorilla family bgf and other factions that control oakland okay. and the bay area so gangs never were able to like infiltrate the bay. Uh, even to this day it's like you know and trust me you know they've come up but they just got ran out you know interesting. for some reason yeah so and it's kind of crazy and not to even, not even to go take it any other, you know, mm -hmm. any, for anybody to feel any kind of way. It's just like, we just didn't. Didn't trip. Yeah. We, you know, it, it was, it was kind of. Even doing the crack era? Like even doing the crack era? Yeah. Yeah. Many, many. Okay. That's what I want to say. I, I want to, I, you know, you always want to tread lightly and, and say things. I understand. Politically correct, but. In a sense, like we could never see how you could just follow blindly behind something. And our whole thing is, if you gonna get in and you gonna go somewhere, why would you all wear the same shit? Because I remember one time, some like when um, Easy and um, NWA came and performed. They performed. There's a there's a big there's a concert at the Henry J. This had to be like eighty eight, eighty nine, mm -hmm. and it was the first time. Me personally, that I seen like Crips because there was this. I guess a lot of them came up behind NWA, and it was a big fight in the on the dance floor. And I'm a kid. I'm I'm like up in the stands watching, and I watched it all unfold. And I seen, you know, the fight started. Then all of a sudden, you see these all du these dudes get, you know, back to back in like a circle. They all had on bluish color stuff, and then the fight started. You know, they got whooped. And then when it was over and the lights came on, you could just see all the dudes wearing blue. And the security grabbed all the people wearing blue, whooped them again, and then threw them out. Mm. And it's like, you know, and I seen the, the, the dudes I was from the Bay and from Oakland, you know, cats from the village that I recognized, they just kind of turned their back and fit right back into the crowd because they weren't dressed a certain way. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, okay. And I could just never understand, like, why would you come somewhere basically wearing a uniform? saying that this is me because when shit happens they got they got rolled up by the niggas in oakland then they got rolled up again by security because they was all wearing mm, it was identifiable they was identifiable right so right. you know we could just I, I just couldn't and a lot of, i know a lot of people we just couldn't fathom why why you would do that mm. <laughs> like it didn't it didn't make sense <laughs> to put it simple and plain okay. and it wasn't like they was tougher Cause I got whooped, you know what I mean. So it just, it just, you know, same thing with with Chicago right. and that gang thing wearing their hats, cop. It's like obviously when you go somewhere, you have to respect it, right? Right, right. You know, because I seen growing up also when I was in high school, this cat from Chicago, he came up to this school that I was going to, and he was talking all of this stuff, but he's only one guy, like. It doesn't travel with you. Okay. Just to say that it, they they didn't know what a vice lord was or whatever, and he got put in the hospital. Mm. 
just for saying it. Mm. You know, I always, you know, I'm always one like, you know, I don't care if you win Bloom, Bloomfield, Indiana, whatever they claim in a calling, you got to respect it while you're there. Okay. And I think that's just how, how I've always moved, you know, because like I said, touring since, since the 80s, it was crazy, right? Right. And I've never had an issue. That's from my, my next question. Sure. That was my next yeah. question. I mean, you know, what? being you guys bringing the funk, uh, unless you bring the funk with some other things along with it, you pretty much don't have no real issues, right? No, nah, I never had an issue. And, and the other thing that I that I noticed coming up in the game is like I always remember because remember, like you know, Atron, he used to um, when he managed, you know, he wrote managed for NWA and JJ Fad and all of them. Right. He worked for Ruthless, so when they would come up to Oakland. I always got to go to the shows okay. when they made appearances because, you know, we were under Atrium and he had access. So I just remember whenever NWA came, I remember one time they came up and they had like this walkthrough or this appearance at this club called the Omni in North Oakland. Okay. And I'm with Atrium, but NWA is in there and I just hear all the little cats around going like, man, I'm about to. I'm about to see how gangster they really is. Mm. You know, everywhere you go, if you claim gangster, they, the gangsters in each city want to right, they want their gangster. It's like the old yeah, they, you know, yeah, yeah. They, they want to they want to gauge their gangster against right, the gangster. Right, and I just never wanted to have to deal with that because I saw the problems that it brought. Wow, and that's that's, that's with anything. And I kind of felt like um, you kind of speak into existence what you what you want in hmm. life. You know what I mean? Right, right. So if you if you always talking about gangster and going to jail and getting shot, eventually something like that's gonna hmm. gonna come to fruition or it's gonna present itself. So I always felt like, well, if I talk about enough pussy and <laughs> drink and, and money <laughs> party, right, right, it, was right. gonna, it was gonna come to me. Okay. So, so I made sure to always mention it. I ain't mad at you, Doc. I say here, Doc. That's been, pretty much been my, my whole conversation since 1986, okay? I, I get it 100%. Much love. I appreciate because, that. Because, uh, you know, like, you know, I came up, I came up under an Egyptian lover. And, dude, I used to fantasize when I used to listen to Egyptian. <laughs> used to talk about how the women is, I was like, man, Egyptian lover must just be laying up in it. <laughs> See, I wanted to. I wanted to be that. People don't realize even even the cats like us, Egypt and LA Dream Team and Wrecking Crew, we had influence also, man. This is a different type of influence, you know. Mm-hmm. It made it, you know when I met Short for the first time. I didn't be Short until about three years ago for the first time. I stuck oh, my hand. I stuck my hand out to me. Hey, you know, I, I want to introduce myself. And he said, "Nigga, I know who you are. Oh boy, you lines a world class wrecking crew. I got all yeah, your exactly. records and boom, 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 boom. So you know, we we carry weight. Then he know we carried it. Because I, 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 before I was a rapper, I thought I was going to be a DJ. Okay. So I had, you know, I had every record. I had a cabbage patch, surgery, and okay. motherfucking, uh, every, you know, dollar free. Okay. LA, you know, LA Dream Team is cool. I, I bought all those records. Everything, dude, if it had the McCola thing on it. Right, right. It. Okay. You know what I mean? And techno pop and all that shit. Techno hop. And, and remember, um... What was that? It was a, it was an Ichiban record. Ichiban, yeah, yeah. I was out of, I was out of uh, JDC, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I used to just buy those records, like wow. when they came out, because you know back then you could go in and you could listen to them, but after a while, you 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 could buy records because back then also, if you really didn't like it, and I knew the people at the record store, I could take it back, right? Exchange right. it, right. you know what I mean? So, I kind of like that was. That was that was kind of like in what was that like eighty four, eighty five ish, right? Right, right. That's when I was most impressionable at fifteen, fourteen years old. Okay. So and and you guys didn't have pictures on the record. So all we could do was just imagine what it was like. Right. You understand what I'm saying? So and I'm hello, baby. Where I am and I'm like, ah, ah, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Like right, because Cause I'm I'm originally from, and on the flip side of it, I'm originally from the East Coast. I'm from Philadelphia. Okay. Is where my family's from, so I would always get go back to back east for the summers to okay. Philly and New Jersey. So I would take those records 
and cassettes with me. You know, I had the two short tapes before he was making records. Okay. I had the Egyptian Lover shit and, and all of that. And I used to go back to Philly and I'd be playing and they'd be like, what the fuck is, get that shit out of here. You know what I mean? They'd say, what the fuck is that like, bro? I don't understand. And so I was, I was, at the time I was, I was trying, even back then I was trying to push what we were doing mm-hmm. to them. They wasn't hearing it. And then at the same time, I was also bringing back Curtis Blow, AJ Scratch, right. Houdini shit, before we got it in Oakland and on the West Coast. So I was getting the best of both worlds growing up. You know, I was getting the, obviously all of the West Coast shit that they couldn't get. Right. But when I would go back East, I would bring home all of the East Coast shit early. So, you know, I would always tell people, I'm probably one person that has more hip hop knowledge than most people because I have it from both sides. Okay. Like extensively. Okay. Like, you know, the cats that originated hip hop, they really only know the East Coast shit. And like the real LIO or right, right. West Coast cats that just kind of was deep into it. They really only know what we were doing. But I was I was bouncing back and forth okay. the whole time growing up. And I was I was soaking in everything. Okay. So and then it even it even if you think about it, it helped me when we finally did start traveling as Digital Underground because, you know, when you, when you, are you from LA originally? Yeah, born and raised. Okay, so you born and raised. And you remember when you first left LA and started traveling, you, it was like a culture shock when you would yeah. see different things, right? Yeah. But it wasn't to For me you, because right. I had already seen it. Right, So right. And so of, of our group and, and people to this day, like, you know, I went and did, um, um, uh, what? Sway, you know, Heather B, she rocked with Karis One and them, right? Okay. She told me, she was like, yo, it was like, man, it was like something about you. You was always, you was always cool. And you always just seemed like he was cool. It was because their culture didn't freak me out the okay. way that it freaked some of the other people out. So right. I was able to really like, um, I don't know if you want to say like, I can relate to it. Yeah. And, it yeah. and it didn't, you know, I didn't trip. So I was really cool with everybody where we went because I was able to just kind of fit in and kind of just okay. fall right into what was going on. Let's go back for a minute. Did you? How did you guys sure. get together, man? How did you guys get together in the beginning? Um, obviously, you know, we'll start after Atrium. Okay. You know, Atrium was, was the label. But as far as the group members, um, there's your underground with Shaq G's, baby. Okay. You know, him and uh, he he came by way of to the bay area by way of tampa florida okay he's originally from new york but he went to i think he went to high school um in tampa where okay. his dad lives by the time he got to to the west coast and i think he he i think he did a little pimping on his way <laughs> that's how he, you know he that's had girl. okay i get that like that shit is real that good thing that we're rapping uh-huh. that's a real story you okay. know, he, he was he was he was he was a little street hustling he got his thing and he made it out and i think the the first record it was shock g chop master j and i think they had another dj i forget his name okay because i remember i had underwater rhymes before i was even in the group oh okay i thought it was a dope i had it was a dope record okay yeah to me um uh around the same time me and dj fuse were raw fusion Okay. And, that, and another cat, Mac Moan. We had our own group, but we were locally doing talent shows and, and trying to get on. But DJ Fuse was recognized probably as the one of the dopest DJs in the Bay. Okay. And Digital Underground needed a DJ, right? And through mutual friends, there was a meeting set up and they wanted Fuse to be their DJ. But Fuse was kind of like we're a package deal. You know, mm. you gotta fuck with all of us. And long story short, kind of that's how I, that's how it started. Well, how did Tupac and, get in the group then? Um, Tupac was initially was he initially signed as a group to Patron and TNT Records. Okay, right. And when their group thing wasn't working out. Tupac was retained as a solo artist under TNT Records for okay. Atrium. And, you know, Atrium was trying to get him a deal for a minute and things weren't moving as fast as he as he wanted them to. 
Um, but mind you, all the while we were doing Do What You Like and working on the first mm-hmm. album, Tupac was around. He was signed to the later. So okay. we, were, we were all working in the same um uh you know, yeah. we were all right. We were all around. Kind of like, you know, yeah, yeah DOC, JJ Fab, NWA, you yeah. guys were all everybody in the circle. Around. Everybody in the same circle. So he was in our circle, but he just wasn't officially in the group. When we came back from Europe after our first Europe tour and we were about to do our first US tour, Adrian asked Shock to if we could bring him on the tour because Adrian was fearing that he was going to lose Tupac because it was taking too long okay. for him to get a deal. And so that's how Pac, mm. you know, got in the group because he was already in our circle. It was like, it really wasn't, it was a no brainer. Okay. You know what I mean? He was already working on music. We were all working together anyway. So okay. like, all right, cool. Let's rock. And he got out there and it just worked. And then after the same song, you know, the rest is history. And that was a crazy ass movie, man. Uh, what was that called again? What was that movie called? Nothing But Trouble. Nothing But Trouble, right. With uh, Dan Aykroyd and um, and uh, who else is that? And, uh, John Candy. John Candy, yeah. Moore. And it was a weird movie. It was a weird, it was like a bad dream type of movie to me, che- man. Chevy Chase. Chevy Chase. Yeah, it was like some- it was some cult. It, yeah, it was some cult shit, yeah. and it was really crazy. If you haven't seen it yet, you got to check it out. But when I remember when I saw them pull up in the limousine in the, in the Hurts. Y'all was in the Hurts in the movie. Yeah. And I heard them break out with the same song, and Homeboy started playing the uh, the judge. So I said, oh, the Tupac. I'm like, ain't this something? And I know you guys. I knew of you guys right. through Atrium. Right. And I was like, damn. they go, they, 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 And then they came out with the shit. I'm like, ain't just something else, man. The whole movie was spooky. It was really weird. You know, it was it wasn't a, a horror movie, but it had some some weird shit. And yeah, it was ass. like some dark, it yeah. was like some dark cult, cultish type. And, and it's funny because it's a for a lot of people, it's a cult classic. Yeah, you know, even if it's just because you were in, yeah. you know, all of the characters that were in it. But I remember when I went to go see it in the theaters. As it was playing, I was kind of slumping in my seat. I was yeah. like, oh, this is a bad movie. I yeah. thought it was just terrible. Wow. I was embarrassed to be in it, but it worked out. It worked you know? out, man. It worked out. Now, how did, how did Tupac get that solo in that uh, that, that plan or something that he just came up with during, the, during that particular song, or was that what? What do you mean? I know he, he, he had a chance to bust a little something, something in that movie, and uh, that was- Well, we were, we, were, we, were, we were on tour. Right? Okay. And we were actually, I think we were in between tours. So we got, as we were getting off the tour, you know, we got, we got the opportunity to do the song, you know, okay. and shock was like, Hey, we're about to do this new song. This is the beat. He sent us tapes. I actually have a cassette that he sent us. Wow. I have a copy of the cassette okay. that he sent us. And he's like talking to him. He's like, all right, look, this is what we're going to do. All right, Tupac. You do eight bars here. Mine, you do yours right here. And okay. I'm going to do this. And this is what the song is about. And this is the concept. And so we were given eight bars each. Okay. Plus, okay. And we did it. And then actually when we recorded the song on that next tour, we kind of previewed it. Not the, We didn't preview the beat, but we would kick the verses during like this extended version of the Humpty Dance at the end of the show. Okay. So we were, we were basically doing the song before it came out, people didn't know it. Wow. And um, she came out and it just, it worked. Okay. All right. So, let me do a quick plug. Know. My guest today, folks, is, is Money B from Digital Underground, uh, Triple OG out of, out, of, out of Northern California. Oakland? You Oakland? Yes, sir. Okay. Oakland. East Oakland, West Oakland? You... Nah, it's, um, I always tell people, like, I, I bounce around in, in Oakland so much. If I, if I, <laughs> you can't claim the section. I tell people, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would always say I'm from around the lake. Okay. I like merit. Okay. But, you know, people people claim me in different areas. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I got I'm, a lot. I, I, Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I would say more people, if people will more know me from, like, North Oakland, Berkeley okay. area. I got a lot of family up in Oakland, man. I love East Oakland, mm-hmm. uh, East 14th, MacArthur, over in that area over there. Me and my cousin, uh, we used to hang out at the uh, at Lake Merritt from time to time, man, on Sunday, dude. That was something else for me. That that, that was a culture shock for me, okay? Yeah, Lake Merritt. Lake Merritt, okay? Yeah, we had a ball up there. 
All right, folks, man, I ain't gonna hold you up, Doc. Man, thank you for your time, man. I much appreciate the interview. I'm sure my my uh my folks are gonna subscribe, like, and share. Money B, you got something you want to tell them to, man? You got an email? I mean, not email, but a uh, Instagram or a oh, yeah. website. Instagram. Um, yeah, everybody, follow me. Um, at Money B sixty nine, like the position. And at Money B sixty nine. That's uh, that's um, Instagram and Twitter. Or you can follow on Facebook. Just follow the Digital Underground fan page or Money Bee fan page. And I got got the Money Bee and Young Hump album coming out. Um, look for Mask, which is Money Bee and Scott Knox. You got the Money Bee solo project. There's going to be a soundtrack to my book. Okay. So it's music coming. Look for the book. Right now it's called Hype Man, the Money Bee Story. Definitely pick up your Digital Underground merchandise at digitalundergroundtshirts.com or dumerch.com. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm rocking. I'm working. I'm so mad that really, we if all you, are. If you, if, if you, if you follow me on on um, Instagram, okay, I'm always promoting what I'm doing. So you can keep up with me that way. You got it. And folks. if you drop me a line, I'll definitely I answer all my DMs. All right, know, hey, if, if I do the same sense. thing. I, I know bullshit though. Okay. <laughs> all right, Money B, much love, folks. You're live with Lonzo, the Godfather of West Coast hip hop. My guest today has been my man, Money B from Digital Underground, folks. Much love, folks. West, 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 West always, baby. I, Peace. All right.